All right, so hopefully you got some stuff written down. If you didn't, that's cool. You guys can still talk about it when you're in your groups. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up those rooms now. And then you guys can chit chat about what could you recall without looking at your notes? Like what did you just remember from what we learned on Monday and Tuesday? So there are the rooms. I'll give you guys about five minutes to talk and then we'll come together as a group. Screen and you'll tell me what you thought was important. So, do, 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 do. Hannah, you are up first. Okay. Um. Yeah. I. Uh. I guess just the first was that this unit is about categorical data and uh, seeing whether or not there's an inference between the two categories. I think. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Seeing inference, and we want to know if they're independent or not. Right. Yes. Good. Perfect. Isn't it funny how we can remember some parts of the big ideas, and then the other parts, you're like, I know that word starts with an I. Yeah, I did write that down, like when I got to the H O part or the H not. So. <laughs> Great. All right, Chris. Hi, I'm really sorry, but I wasn't here the past two days. My laptop charger seems to have gone missing. So I'm using my mom's right now, but I had some pretty stellar group partners and they let me know about that the H naught doesn't really change based on now in the last unit and about the categorical data, like Hannah said, and which ones are independent and which ones aren't. Good. I'm so glad that your group members were there to help you out. And uh, I think that we can all relate to having like a crappy couple days where technology isn't on our side. So that's totally okay. All right. So H naught doesn't change from the last section. So <clears throat> um, I just want to kind of dig deeper into that because that's a really big idea. So um, any big like blanket ideas that we have about H naught or any like small ideas we have about H naught. So how is H naught the same in this section as previous sections? So does anybody want to take a whack at telling me that? I mean, I can, <laughs> what, what I was uh, kind of understanding was that we assume that H naught is what is stated. So we assume that the variables are independent. Good, so we always give H naught the benefit of the doubt, no matter what unit we're in. Awesome, all right, Evan, you are up next. Um, and it's anything in the last two days, right? I didn't. Yeah, okay. Um, important. Um, I mean, finding the values without having an expected value is probably pretty important. I mean, it's simple, but it's pretty important to do. Good. So finding those expected values when you don't have them. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, Ashley. So um, I remembered the equation where you multiply the row total by the column total, and then you divide by the overall total, but I forgot what that was for. <laughs> oh my gosh, that goes right along with what Evan was saying, and that is how we find the expected value for each cell. Okay. All right. Row total, column total. Okay, good. And last but not least, Miss Madeline. Um, I remember that um, the bigger the chi-square number is, the less accurate it is, right? And then also, I remember the equation that would be observation minus the expected and then that was all squared over the expected value and then you do that for each number in the box and you add them all up to find the chi-square 
Oh, you guys are so great. All right. All right, I'm almost done typing this up. All right, awesome. I'm so impressed because that is like really the meat and potatoes of what we've been talking about over the last two days. So I am so happy right now. Um, is there anything that somebody didn't say that somebody would like to jump in and be like, oh, don't forget about this. Uh, the main chi-square equation, is the uh, um, observation minus expect expected squared over expected. Good. And then the DF, the, the degrees of freedom. I don't know if someone said that. Yeah. Row yeah. minus one and then the column. Was it, is it, yeah, the number of rows minus one and then the number of columns minus one? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So before we move on to the big example that I had for today, just as a teacher for my own, my own inference, um, do you feel like this exercise in the jot and recall, do you feel like that was helpful to kind of get together and talk about the ideas? So just give me like a happy face or a thumbs up or whatever, if you felt like it was helpful. Yeah, okay, cool, awesome, yay. I, um, I was really crappy at studying actually when I was in college because I really just wanted to do it all by myself and I would just read and read and read and nothing would stick and I would get this test anxiety and I realized that I didn't have test anxiety. What I had was I had a panic when I realized that like none of the information I read stuck. Right, it almost felt like the whole time I was studying, I was like trying to put a ball on a slanted shelf and it wouldn't stay. And I found out that that shelf got a lot straighter and more level if I actually like talked the ideas out with another person. So I'm super happy that this helped. So I'm just gonna share this, um, this screen with you guys so you can kind of see the ideas that we jotted down. I'll also shoot this out in an email um, or post it on the notes. So this is everything that you guys said was important, which is amazing because it's almost exactly what I would say was important from this section. So the next thing that we're going to do today is we're going to do a full hypothesis test with some data. But before we do that, I just wanted to show you what a chi-square distribution looks like. So we use chi-square because it doesn't look normal and it also depends on the degrees of freedom so here is what a chi-square distribution actually looks like it is right skewed and what happens here is as we increase our degrees of freedom this distribution actually does tend to become more normal. Now, the reason it is so left skewed or right skewed, meaning that we have this big bump on the left-hand side is because we always take all of the differences in our observations and square them. But that means that, means that our chi-square value is always gonna be positive, AKA greater than zero. So all these little differences are going to be made when our observations are really close to our expected values. That means that our null hypothesis is true. So that's why we have this big hump right here, because that's what we would expect to happen if our null hypothesis was true. It starts to get skinnier and smaller as we move outward, because that is when our null hypothesis is not true. That means that we're going to see a really big difference between our expected and our observed data. So um, just so you know, this little red line right here, that is supposed to determine your cutoff depending on what your, um, 
your chi-square value is. And then this line that we have right here, you might not be able to see it until I start moving it. That's our actual chi-square value. So if our chi-square value gets into this red area to the right, then what we're going to see is we're going to see a situation where we get to reject the null hypothesis and these two categorical data are actually um, probably dependent, which means that they have some sort of relationship between each other. So just one more thing I'm going to add to this, not that you guys should have known before because I never showed you, is that chi-square is always a right-tailed test. So in previous units like unit um, six and unit seven, we could either have a right tailed, a left tailed test, or a twin tailed test. And those related to whether we thought that the population was greater than, less than, or just different. In this one, because the null and the alternative hypothesis never change, and we're only looking at a positive, absolute difference between our observed and expected, it's always going to be a right-tailed test. All right. Now for the big example. Do, 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 do. Oop, there we go. All right. So what we have is that a railroad system is interested in the relationship between the distance that somebody has traveled and the ticket class that they purchased. So what they did is that they interviewed 200 passengers and they asked them, hey, how far have you traveled and what class of ticket did you purchase? And they got this data. So go ahead and jot down um, this table and also A and B. And then when you're finished, go ahead and give me a little flag emoji so I know that you are ready to move on.
All right, how's it going? You guys almost got that written down? Yeah, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. All right. Cool. Give you guys one more minute to write that down. All right. So what we have is that we have third class, second class, first class, and we also have the distance one to 100 miles, 101 to 200. And the one thing that I want to point out really quick is that it would be very easy for us to not recognize that this is categorical data because they are using numbers. However, this is ordinal, which means there's a first, second, and third, so it's automatically categorical. The other thing is that these numbers are split up into bins. So because they're in bins, again, categorical. So the first thing that we wanna do is we wanna state what our hypotheses are. So our null hypothesis in this case would be ticket class, our first kind of variable, and distance, our second kind of variable, are independent. independent. So probably the hardest part about writing the null hypothesis is just making sure that you distinguish the variables correctly. So sometimes people will be like, um, ticket class and something else. I don't know. That's usually the only thing that I see incorrect. Then the alternative hypothesis is almost exactly the same, only you're going to insert that little word not into there. So we're either going to find evidence that they are independent or we're going to find evidence that they're not independent. Now, <clears throat> just remember what we learned from the first and second unit in this course is that just because two things aren't independent doesn't mean that they directly affect each other. There could be a lurking variable in there. There could be a reason that these two things seem related, but one doesn't necessarily cause the other one. All right, and then for part B, we wanna find the degrees of freedom for this guy. So the degrees of freedom are going to be the total number of rows we have minus one. So if I look at the rows, I have one, two, three, four, and five. So we don't count the total row, row when we get there. So it's one, two, three, four, and five. So we're gonna have five minus one, and then we're gonna do the column totals. So we have third, second, and first class. So that's going to be three minus one. So our total degrees of freedom are going to be four times two, which is going to give us eight degrees of freedom. Okay. Looking good so far? All right, if I'm going too fast, please don't hesitate to unmute and just say, um, you know, hold on, I need a second or. Um, on the, sorry, on the degrees of freedom. So number of rows, one, two, three, four is five. And then number of columns, one, two, three, it's not four, it's three. Yep, so you don't count the uh, total. One, two, three. Oh, and you don't count distance? Okay, okay. Good.
All right. Now, the next one is we want to know how many passengers are expected. Ooh, that means I'm going to have to find an expected value to travel between 201 and 300 miles and purchase a second class ticket. So what this means is we are going to want to find the expected value for that cell right there. So when we want to find the expected value for a cell, what we are going to have to do is we're going to have to take the row total times the column total, and then divide by the overall total. So to find the expected value for that cell, we're going to have to have the row total, which is 48. So you go all the way to the end of the row times the column total for that cell, which is going to be 67. And then you're going to divide by the overall total, which will be 200. Now, remember, it's totally fine if this comes out to be a decimal because you're using percentages and you're just trying to figure out what's expected. So we're going to have 67 and 48 divided by 200. So we're going to get about 16.08 for that expected value. So the observed, observed was 17 and the expected is 16.08. All right, good. <clears throat> now we have 15 minutes left. So what I would like you guys to do in the next 10 minutes is I want you to use that website, that technology that I gave you guys in um, the other unit. So I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste that website into the chat just so you guys don't need to open a bunch of stuff and remember how to get there. And I want you to use that technology to answer the next three questions, which is what's the expected value for people that travel between 401 and 500? What is the test statistic, aka chi-squared? And also tell me what is the p-value. So I won't put you guys in breakout rooms. I'll just leave this page open for you so that you can write down the questions and refer back to them as you do it. All right, when you are finished, remember I'm giving you guys uh, about 10 minutes to do that. When you're finished, if you could go ahead and let me know, um, say something in the chat or put up an emoji, that would be cool. I'm also gonna mute my camera and stop my video because when you guys are working, I'm just staring at myself and freaking out. So let me know if you need anything.
All right, go ahead and wrap up what you're doing. And I will show you um, what I got when I put it into the calculator. <clears throat> So here's the calculator that I put into the chat, and here is our data. The number one thing to remember when you're entering the data into the calculator is that you don't want to add the totals. So when you look at the contingency table, which is what this guy is called, <clears throat> you don't want to add the column total or the row totals you only want to put the observations in there. If you did put the observations into that calculator, that's totally okay. You can just move this little guy over and it'll get rid of them. Okay. So after you add your last observation, which should be 10, once you hit enter, you're going to get your chi-square down here at the bottom, as well as your degrees of freedom and your p-value. Now, if you scroll down even further, <clears throat> what you're going to see is that you're going to see your expected values right here. So if we look at where that expected value for 400 to 500 miles in a first class ticket would be, that would be the very last expected value that we should see. So that expected value should be 6.6. .6. Now, if you're like me and you just see a sea of numbers, you're more than welcome to find the expected value by hand. Okay, if I am asked to only find one expected value, I'm like, I'd rather do it by hand than look at this crazy sea of numbers. Totally up to you. Now, E asks us, what is the test statistic? So the test statistic is what we're learning about in unit eight. That's going to be your chi-square. So our chi-square is our test statistic, and we found that to be 15.9228. And associated that, and our degrees of freedom, is our p-value, which in our case, we found our p-value to be 0 0.0435. Now, the last question is what can we conclude at a 5% significance level? So just like in unit six and in unit seven, if P is low, we get to reject our H naught. So since our P value, which is 0 0.0435 is less than our SIG level, which is 0 0.05, we can reject our null hypothesis. In other words, what we get to say is that we found evidence, there is a relationship between ticket class and distance. Oh my gosh, thank you. <laughs> Love you. Sorry, I just got a breakfast delivery and it smells epic. So. <clears throat> so that is the end of how we look at chi-square. So um, what we're going to be doing tomorrow is I'm going to be giving you guys a big example. I'm going to have you do the whole thing on your own and then we're going to check back in with each other and see how we did so does it make sense where are any fuzzy points things like that and don't forget that i'm also going to um save this and post it on that unit eight so you guys can take a look at this later if you want some more examples so that is all i have for you guys today does anybody have any thoughts or questions before we call it a day?
Nope, looking good. All right, well, I'm so proud of you guys. You did amazing work today. You should feel like super freaking smart for the rest of the day. Like just walk around and be like, I know Pi-square, not a big deal, okay? All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye, y'all. Thank you. Have Thank a you. good day.